Gracias, eh, Monseñor eh, Marcelo Sánchez Sorondo, por la acogida que la Academia Pontificia nos ha dado a miembros de la Academia de Ciencia de Latinoamérica. Y, por supuesto, a nuestro amigo y miembro del Consejo Académico de ACAL, eh, Edi, que ha hecho un trabajo extraordinario, un esfuerzo tremendo para conseguir eh, esta reunión. Well, uh, I do not come from the genetic field until my retirement. Okay, thanks. Until my retirement from active research, I was acti active in enzyme kinetics and mechanism and in coagulation research. However, after my retirement, I turned my interest into public health problems in Venezuela. I believe that there is no better scenario for this reflection. I changed the title uh, a little bit of the, uh, yep. Uh, for this reflection than this past ACAL meeting. I do hope that this reflection will stimulate new ideas and approaches that would help to correct the actual inacceptable conditions in our countries. The metilloma constitute the central core of the epigenetic regulatory mechanisms. These are, by a definition, metabolic processes capable of modulate the functional behavior of the genetic imprints without altering the DNA sequences. Genome and epigenome works together. And this crucial relationship is the subject of a superb effort in basic research, especially in the last two decades, in order to obtain precise information on its role in human disease. Soon after the human genome sequence was completed, it was clear that a map of the genome-wide modifications made to DNA and the protein scaffold that support it was also needed. Thus, in 2005, the idea of developing an epigenomic map start making noise. The blueprint of the human epigenomic map came to life in 2010 and the International Epigenomic Consortium was created. The Roadmap Epigenomics Project is the equivalent to the Human Genome Project. Also, DNA methylation is probably the most detailed study of epigenetic modification of mammalian DNA Other mechanisms are also responsible for epigenetic modifications, mainly through acetylation of histones, the proteins involved in the protection and packaging of the, uh, of the genetic material, in the basic chromatin unit or nucleosome. Moreover, a post-transcriptional level of regulation is conferred by a small non-coding RNAs term microRNAs, and yesterday, uh, Eddie brought uh, a new possible mechanism, uh, which is the methylation, uh, the arginine methylation, that may be also very important in uh, those regulations. Also, these regulatory systems use distinct mechanisms. There is a good deal of functional overlap and crosstalk among them. Histone proteins constitute the major organizational and regulatory units of chromatin. They serve in eukaryotes not only for packaging of the genetic material, but also offer the structural basis for regulation of processes such as replication, transcription, and repair of DNA. A chromatin unit consists of a protein octamer composed of two molecules of each isomorphic histones. Around this molecular arrangement is wrapped a 147 base pair chain of DNA to form nucleosome cores. Usually, the site of modification is on the amino terminal histone tails. Different modifications, which include acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, among others, are common. Such modifications can, can induce a structural change in the nucleosome through change in the electrostatic charge of the protein or modulating the organization of the complex. Different enzymes are in charge of the post-translational modification of chromatin subunits. They may alter the nucleosome structure in several ways. 
A, modulating the organization of the supramolecular structure of chromatin, B, changing the electrostatic charge of the proteins and therefore its interaction with DNA, or C, recruiting other proteins that could act remodeling chromatin. In relation to its transcriptional state, chromatin can be said of having an actively transcribed euchromatin and an inactive heterochromatin. The former is characterized by high levels of acetylation and trimethylation, while heterochromatin shows low levels of acetylation but maintaining high levels of methylation. Acetyl residues removal is affected by histone deacetylases establishing the positive lysine charge and restoring the DNA binding affinity. Of course, it is an oversimplification of all the process. The other relevant modification is DNA methylation. This is the process by which a methyl group is added to the fifth position of cytosine bases of DNA to form 5-methyl cytosine. So far, it is the only known epigenetic mechanism that directly modifies the DNA molecule. Also, it is a covalent modification of the DNA molecule that can be inherited. It is also subject to dynamic changes which are linked to diet and other environmental influences. DNA methylation occurs almost exclusively in the context of CPG dinucleotides, which are distributed in cluster naming CPG island. The precise mechanism for translation of the methylation code into gene expression or repression are not yet well known. They are, however, very hot areas of research. In mammals, DNA methylation is a highly organized process set up early in development that involves genome-wide demethylation and de novo methylation. The first episode of DNA methylation erasure occurs in the blastocyst following fertilization, while on implantation, the embryo undergoes a wave of de novo methylation. This process establishes a new methylation pattern, which is copied during division of somatic cells. After fertilization, most of the paternal genome is rapidly demethylated through an active enzymatic demethylation process, while the maternal genome undergoes passive replication-dependent demethylation over subsequent cleavage divisions. After implantation, a reprogramming, that is, a phase of global de novo methylation reestablishes the DNA pattern that will be maintained in large part in somatic tissues. After implantation, there are no additional global changes in DNA methylation and all other modifications, methylation, demethylation, seems to be sequence directed uh, specific. Even from this brief and necessarily very general description of the epigenetic landscape, it is clear that alteration in almost any single step in the molecular mechanism involved will potentially affect the correct gene expression. This can lead to congenital anomalies, defined as a structural or functional anomalies that can be identified at birth, or sometimes only be detected later in infancy or as happened with cardiovascular disease, <coughs> diabetes, cancer, and many other pathologies, only in the adult organism. In this regard, it's of paramount importance the concept that the appropriate functionality of the epigenomic landscape is highly dependent on ambient influences. That is to say that besides pure genetic factors, such as inherited genes that cause for an anomaly, or as a result of sudden, not well understood gene mutations, environmental factors such as prenatal, maternal health, exposure to pesticides, and certain medications, and particularly nutritional deficiencies, play an important role in the methylome functionalities. This oversimplified scheme shows the relationships between the underlying epigenetic landscape landscape uh, on the right, uh, on the left side uh, is represented by, <coughs> by this small square there, <coughs> and the environmental factors to which human beings are exposed. The, follow <coughs> the following statement by Professor Melody Goodman reflects the idea perhaps much better. 
your zip code is a better predictor of your health than your genetic code. Think under this perspective, we may think of two non gracias non including alternatives through which healthcare may benefit from basic research. A, taking appropriate actions to counteract the effect of negative environmental factors. B, applying the wondrous progress in cell and molecular biology from the last three decades, especially in the area of genetics, to develop therapeutic protocols directed to correct natural mistakes. Clearly, the link between the methylome and the environment is the biochemical pathway centered in the homocysteine methionine cycle. Folate from the diet constitute the main, if not the only source of methyl groups, and methionine, which is an essential amino acid, can only be obtained from animal proteins in the diet. Of course, mutation in any of the enzymes involved in folate uptake and metabolism may be possible. In the period from 1960 to 1965, a series of communications appeared which gave evidence of a possible relationship between fetal malformation and defective folate metabolism in the model. Indeed, it was the result of serendipity and basic research. Briefly, in 1952, Tiersch published a controversial paper in which he studied the ability of aminopterin to induce abortion in human beings. 10 years later, in 1962, Gutsch published results from an evaluation of aminopterin as an abortifacient. Anecdotally, the paper was followed by a discussion authored by Dr. Russell Alvarez, in which he states that Tier's paper was not a publication from the Pacific Northwestern Obstetrical and Gynecological Association and that, on the contrary, they do not condone nor recommend the use of antifolate for the production of therapeutic abortion. What is even more interesting is that Alvarez describes the role of folic acid in terms of, at that time, in terms of its function as a methyl group donor for the synthesis of nucleic acid and remarks the requirement of an exogenous source of folic acid. The effect of folate deficiency on the development of rat embryo was initially described in 1960. And also more than 50% of congenital anomalies cannot be yet associated with a specific cause. Also, we have seen from several uh, talks yesterday and today, uh, Dr. Uh, Stoll uh, also, that uh, every day some gene is identified and they try to link it to some disease. It is estimated that a number of env environmental factors would play an important role in not less than 15% of congenital anomalies considered multifactorial. These factors include socioeconomic and demographic factors, maternal nutrition status, diabetes, alcoholism, smoking, drugs, exposure to ter teratogenic chemicals, and maternal infections, among others. Neural tube defects cardiovascular system defects, Down syndrome, and cleft lip and or palate anomalies represent the largest proportion of birth defects detected at birth. That's something that one has to differentiate. Uh, what uh, you presented is a very interesting uh, case of a problem that may be solved before but it's only detected when the child is one, two, three years old. Uh, these anomalies, classified as multifactorial, have been associated with preconceptional folate deficiency, combined, especially in third world countries, with general nutritional deficiency. It is not worthy that even in countries where the general population has adequate food intake, folate deficiency is present. Based on the compelling experimental evidence in 1992, the U.S. Public Health Service recommended that all women of childbearing age consume 400 micrograms of folic acid daily. And there were a lot of guidelines for that 
none of them really work for reasons that we may clarify later. But this led to the implementation in 1998 of a public health program which has shown an excellent cost-benefit ratio. That is, the mandatory implementation of fortification of consumer food with folic acid. Several advantages were noted. A is not ethically discriminatory because it will reach most people in any country. Second, it covers the preconception period, especially important for women in reproductive age. And C is easily implemented and have an excellent cost-benefit ratio. This program has been compulsory adopted by 81 countries. In the region, only Venezuela has not recommended or has not implemented the mandatory fortification program. In this regard, just as uh, for comparison between countries that have the program working and not working, it is uh, relevant to note that Chile or Costa Rica, where the program has been in effect since 2000, the incidence of neural tube defect is less than five per 10,000 live births, uh, while in Venezuela it is 20 per 10,000 uh, live births. And combined neural tube defects and heart defects reach 50 per, per 10,000 live uh, births. That is unacceptable high. The second alternative that I mentioned above is based in the accelerated progress in genetic research from the last 20 years. This opened a wide range of possible protocols intended to introduce beneficial genetic modification by directly manipulating the genetic machinery. As uh, Eskol uh, said, different name has been adopted for these approaches. Personalized, individualized, genomic medicine, precision medicine, etc. The 2020 advisory group of the European Union defined personalized medicine as a medical model using characterization of individuals, phenotypes, and genotypes for tailoring the right therapeutic strategy for the right person at the right time. But it is clear that this approach is not applicable for any public health program. So far, personalized medicine has been translated to practice predominantly through the use of genetic diagnostics tests connected to a distinct molecular characteristic. Moreover, due to the actual cost, it is ethically discriminatory, highly discriminatory, I would say. Methodological advances may change those concerns. An example is the introduction of a very precise gene editing technique known as uh, CRISPR-Cas9. It was adapted from a naturally occurring uh, genome editing system in bacteria. A detailed description of the technique is out of the scope of these reflections. Clearly, this approach will be of great impact in the advance of personalized medicine, but by definition, it focuses on the individual patient. In order to make personalized medicine effective at the population level, these genomic techniques must be standardized and somehow integrated into public health systems that allows a more equitable distribution of the enormous potential benefit derived from basic research. In this regard, a promissory approach may be the use of genetic manipulation to modify negative ambiental factors such as vectors and or parasites. Uh, in the uh, Dr. Reft talk yesterday, there is another very interesting approach that can be, uh, can reach the whole population. Such an approach has been recently used to fight malaria, a disease which globally affects more than 250 million people worldwide. In one study, a symbiotic bacterium strain, genus Cyriacea, which established colonized and often meat good female ovaries and male accessory glands was genetically engineered for secretion of antiplasmodium effector proteins. And the uh, um, first uh, experimental uh, test shows that that may be a very good way of controlling malaria. The second approach 
focuses on genetically modified mosquitoes to alter expression of their own antiplasmodium immune genes. Those genetically modified mosquitoes showed increased immune activity against plasmodium and an unexpected changes in mating pattern that nobody has explained uh, so far. They have a mating preference of genetically modified males for wild type females, while wild type males prefer genetically modified males. It is previsible that these mating changes will foster the spread of the genetic modification in the mosquito population. To conclude, it seems clear then from this brief account that besides the knowledge derived from basic science, which is absolutely important, the impact of it in individual well-being and in the wide area of public health is of paramount importance. Also, basic researchers and clinicians tend to have different approaches to scientific problems. There are many advantages from successful collaboration within them. While a basic scientist would ask questions such as why and how a phenomenon occurs, a clinician is generally more concerned with the usefulness of the answer for the patient's problem. In developing countries, it is necessary to change the attitude towards interdisciplinary cooperation, starting during the formative years of training. It requires that universities and research institutions diversify training pedagogies to promote interactive activities that bring young clinical and basic researchers together, stimulating the collaborative behavior from the beginning of their careers. In this regard, it is very important also that the scientific community use all his power to change the widespread conception of the useless spending of financial resources in basic research, which, as we know, is a common denominator within most governments, especially in developing countries. ACAL, our academy, could, besides his role in connecting researchers in Latin America, also work at the higher political levels to convince politicians of the benefits of investing and encourage education in science and promote the creation of research facilities like transnational uh, medicine institutes. Further, ACAL has a growing roster of first-class scientists active in research, working in their countries and or in more developed countries that constitute the moving force to accomplish the main purpose of the academy, defined by the founder, members as, and I will read in Spanish, estimular y fomentar el cultivo de las ciencias matemáticas, físicas, químicas, de la tierra y de la vida, y sus aplicaciones en beneficio del desarrollo y de la integración humana, cultural y social de América Latina y el Caribe. Thank you.